God today. Hallelujah, man. One of the many attributes of the God we serve is His unchanging faithfulness. Hallelujah. We see in the Word of God, the saints exalt God's faithfulness through various situations in their lives. How God saw them through, th through the dark days, through tough times, when there was no hope for them. Likewise, as we are gathered before His throne of grace today, this beautiful Sunday morning, let's ask God that God mercifully put His grace, His peace and joy that surpasses all human understanding in our hearts too. Hallelujah. As a church, as we're sitting here, let's ask God that His faithfulness be revealed to us in whatever situation you might be facing, whatever promise has gone unfulfilled in your life, today, surrender it to our God. For He who called us is faithful and able to do above and beyond all that we ask and think. Hallelujah. What a faithful God we have. As a church, let's all lift our voices together. Let's all sing a song of praise to our faithful God today. Hallelujah.
We're going to read from Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 10. If you've got your Bibles with you, would you just open it to Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 10. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went to the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders of Jerusalem. The churches were strengthened in faith and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Messiah, they tried to go to, into Bethania, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Messiah, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Hallelujah. Would you lift your hands out, hallelujah to the Lord. Put your hands together. Thank the Lord for the word that was just read out here. Praise the Lord. Brother and sister, as we read through this particular passage of scripture, you need to understand that the subject here is actually about doors before us in the spirit, you know, being closed and opened before us by God himself. I want to talk to you as my spiritual family so that we could really understand what God is, you know, trying to get done behind the scenes. When a door closes, hundred years before, a child of God, what is God's plan behind that? What is God trying to accomplish? This is something we need to have to think about. And when I started meditating on this particular fact, that sometimes God, doors do get shut before us, God started leading me to this particular verse in scripture where Paul says, now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. What is that telling us? God closed the door there. Did not allow them to go into Asia. Later on, the verse says, they wanted to go to Bithynia also. But again, the Spirit did not permit them. Meaning, another door was closed before them. Later on, through a dream, God speaks to that apostle and he gets to be led or called into this place called Macedonia. What is that? God is opening another door here. Now, hallelujah, when we start thinking about these scriptures and about the doors that were opened and shut, my friend, the first and foremost thing, praise God, that comes to mind would be, praise God, that the fact is God does shut certain doors before us, his children. Even though he's a way maker, even though he's known to be a deliverer, a miracle worker, we also need to understand God in a manner whereby 
we get the idea that sometimes God in his sovereign will closes certain doors before us. How does he do this? The Bible says he sometimes talks to us and tells us not to go forward, not to go through this door before us. At other times, he simply blocks our path, you know, through people, through problems, by arranging circumstances, he simply blocks our path so that we cannot go forward. These are the other two main ways in which God shuts the door before us. But my friend, we need to understand that when God shuts a door, sometimes we who call ourselves children of God, who say God does everything for our good, we get to be irritated, sometimes disappointed, sometimes we end up even getting to be in distress, you know. You know why? Praise God. Many a time, the doors that get closed might be doors that we want to go through. We desire to get to the other side. But God has closed it and we feel very bad. Sometimes, my friend, the doors that shut before us might be doors we've been praying for to be opened up before us. At other times, my friend, we need to understand many of these doors that are shut might be doors that we worked very hard to reach up to. It is only the door that stands between us and what we were waiting for. But this door, it remains shut because the hand of God has shut it. And none else can open it, you know. It's been shut that way. Praise God. When such instances come into our life, how do we deal with it? This is a very important thing that we need to understand, you know. Basically because all of us at one time or the other end up facing shut doors. And if we cannot deal with it properly... We are sure to end up in great disappointment. Sometimes we might end up destroying our own lives because of this. Many people have gone away from the faith, gone away from God because a door that they were praying for it to open up did not do so. So it is very important to understand what to do in a time when God shuts a door before us. I just want to share with you maybe five or six points whereby we can think together on these lines so that we might understand the plans and the purposes of God. Number one, when a door shuts before us, the first and foremost thing that a child of God has to do, I would say, would be trust in God fully. Why do I say this? Because the Bible, when it introduces God, says in Romans 8 and verse 28, for people who love Him, for people who are called by Him, meaning people like us, he makes everything to work together for our good. This is something we need to take in faith, my friend. And when we really understand the crux of that particular verse, we will come to see it is not just those things that we find good in our eyes, but it is also those things that we find to be bad in our eyes that He can make to work together for our good. The Bible is not saying all things that happen are good, you know. But it is actually telling us anything that happens in the life of a child of God will be made to work out for his good at a later stage because God is more than able to change it for your good. God will do that for you. We, my friend, we need to you know, put our trust in him and believe he will make this experience also for our good in the days to come. We got to trust God. Number two. Whenever, my friend, a door shuts before us, it might be a door that we were working to get to, it might be a door that we were praying for it to open up, but whatever that be, when a door shuts before us, we need to secondly understand that God has a bigger plan than we have now. God has a bigger plan than that. Look at what happens here. Paul was actually making plans to go to Asia, but God shut the door. He wanted to go to Haradiyah, Bithynia. Again, God shuts the door. But God had a bigger plan. That is the reason why he shut all these doors. He wanted Paul to go to Macedonia. Why? So that a church might be planted there. When, a, when we read through chapter 16 here, we will find that the church was planted there. And later on, in Romans 15 and verse 26, Paul says, this Macedonian church ended up to be a big time financial partner for Paul's ministry. Again, when we read through 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, God's word again teaches us the Macedonian church were large scale givers. They gave of themselves, meaning they had manpower, 
laid down at Paul's disposal. Again, they gave of their resources, meaning money, so that the ministry might actually expand and do what God had called it to do. Praise God. Paul was actually thinking of maybe going to Asia, preaching the gospel to whomever he could touch. While God had a bigger plan that encompassed many more years of ministry. It was much more than what Paul could think about, dream of, ask for. It was something that was conceived in the heart of God and God alone. And you need to understand it is the same way in the lives of all of us, my friend. Many a time, when we start making our own plans, we end up making plans with the limited data we have. We are limited to time frames and places and boundaries and our own limitations. But you need to understand, when we make limited plans based on our limitations, God is a God who had a plan about our lives even before we were formed in our mother's womb. Even before the foundations of the world were laid, we need to understand we were a thought in God's heart. And that thought, he conceived a plan about our whole life, my friend. That is why the psalmist says, all our days were written in his book. We have not been able to see the whole diary. We have not been able to actually comprehend the whole plan. And because of that, when a door shuts before us, we think this is the end. But God says, no, this is not the end. This is just a detour. And the detour is not taking you away from the right track. It is actually getting you to the right track. That is what you need to understand. God would speak to us. So every time a child of God, as a child of God, when we encounter a shut door, we need to remind ourselves, God has a bigger plan, a better plan. And it is for me to put my trust in God and His goodness. It is for me to remind myself, God is too wise to make a mistake. God is too good to be unkind. His plans, when they work out in my life, that is what will be best for me. I need to to make sure I start thinking on those lines, my friend. What else? The third thing we need to understand when we encounter a shut door is, when the doors in your mind shut before you, Can I repeat that? When the door is in your mind shut before you, understand God has a different door on his mind. Did you get that? We might make our own plans. And sometimes when those doors get shut before us, we end up thinking all the doors before us are shut forever and we've got no place to go to. We can't run to any place. We are stuck now. The Bible would say, you're wrong. You're wrong. It is never ever that way. What happens is, like, you know, this auditorium, it's got so many doors out here. God wants you to maybe move out of this door. But you know what human tendency is like? The person inside the auditorium would see every other door but the one God wants you to move out through. The man in the center of the auditorium would maybe move to that door. If God does not want him to go that way but wants him to go this way, what choice does God have but to shut that one? The man, you know, when he finds that door shut, he will not go to the door that God is holding open for him. He'll most likely go to the door he finds, hallelujah, uh, that looks best in his eyes. He'll go that way. What choice does God have but to shut that door also? One by one, all the doors will get shut before him. But what this man has to understand is, when all the doors he goes to get shut before him, there is still another door that God is holding open for him. Hallelujah. That is something he needs to understand. When the doors in our mind, When they close before us, we need to always remember, God has a different door on his mind. We are just being redirected. Our journey is just being rerouted. So what do we need to do? We need to start looking, my friend. We need to start looking. Where is God leading me to? That is what we need to start thinking about. 
Here's another thought. It's from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8. The Bible echoing the words of Jesus says, I have set before you an open door, no one can shut it. Very famous verse. Very famous verse. Echoing the words of the resurrected Savior. But understand that verse properly. When Jesus opens a door for his children, no one else can shut it. Meaning, no other man, devil. No, they cannot shut the door that Jesus has opened for his child. But you need to understand something. We can shut it. We can. How do we do this? The first way would be, we refuse to walk through the open door God shows us. We go against His will. Would people do it? Of course they would. Because God's will is not what they want. They've got other plans, they've got other desires, they've got other interests. Who is bothered about God and His plans for our life? Maybe and we will be people who are willing to go to church on Sunday, sing a few songs, maybe even give an offering of a 500 buck note. But to submit to God's will fully for the rest of our life, that is no easy job. People don't want to do that. So what do they do? Even when God holds a door open for them, they say, I don't want to go through there, I want a different door. The door gets to be shut. What else? Many a time, Doors that God opens before people gets to be shut because the people in question depend on other ways and not on God for the door to be useful for them. Let me give you a biblical example. You know the story of Joseph about him getting thrown in prison for, you know, holding on to the true things. When we, you know, read through Genesis chapter 40, and verse 14, it teaches us that this man Joseph, who was a very godly character, who knew God intimately, who knew God's will intimately, he interprets a dream for the chief butler, and the chief butler gets reinstated to his former position. What when the chief butler of the Pharaoh is getting ready to pack his bags and go back had to the palace from the prison, Joseph goes to him and says, when you get to the palace, when you stand before the Pharaoh, remember me, remember to say a few good things about me there. What is he trying to do? He's trying to open a door all by himself. He's trying to use his contacts to open hundred doors that only God can open before him. Can I tell you something? I think, I believe, strongly believe that that particular moment was the time God had ordained for his freedom. But because this fellow started trying to do his own thing, using the arm of the flesh and not depend on the Holy Spirit, you know what happened? He had to spend another two years in that prison. Why two years? I believe it was because it took two years for this man, Joseph, to understand even if you do a miracle for another person, for him to remember you, you need God on your side. So, I don't need to depend on people, I just need to trust God, depend on Him. For that revelation to come Joseph's way, it took two whole years. More than 700 days it took. Praise God. But God simply waited and the door just shut in front of Joseph. What else? There is another reason. There is another way in which we can shut the door God has opened before us. That is by missing out on God's timing. Remember Noah's story in Genesis? Genesis 6 and verse 3 echoes God saying this way, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. There is a time up to which I will talk to men. I will tell them, give them instruction on the door they need to go through. You go through Genesis 6, come to Genesis 7, we find the ark being built, Noah and his family going inside, all the animals, the birds and the rest of creation are inside. Now what happens? When we read through the Bible, my friend, in chapter 7 and verse 16 of Genesis, the Bible says, God shut Noah in, meaning the door to the ark was shut by God. I'll put it this way, it was shut 
not before noah it was shut before the rest of the world because they had missed out on god's timing many time we need to understand my friend that the opportunity that presents itself before us because of the hand of god working on our behalf the life of the opportunity is actually limited to the you know the moments that god has ordained for it to be there that is why the bible time and again tells us use the moment use the now moment don't wait until tomorrow to be born again don't wait until tomorrow to be you know baptized don't wait until tomorrow to get holy get right with god don't wait until tomorrow to tell your spouse that you love that person don't wait until tomorrow before hugging your child making your love known to that child because nobody knows what tomorrow holds nobody knows whether there is a tomorrow for us use a now moment use a now moment it's so very important many people miss out on god's time they just simply procrastinate and end up hallelujah losing out on the door god holds open before them you should not be persons like that here's another thought a fifth thought regarding shut doors even though god shuts certain doors before us there are also doors that god opens before us divinely opened doors every divinely opened door has got god's seal of approval on it it is god god's support god's favor god's protection on it you need to understand this what happens to paul when this man named paul he has a call to go to macedonia you need to understand god was actually opening a door for him and when he walked through that door that god had held open for him the bible says he went to the you know river side where prayer meetings were held he started talking to the women there and in acts chapter 16 and verse 14 the bible says god opened the heart of a woman named lydia meaning it was god's favor that gave him the result of having a believer it was god's favor showing up a little later acts 16 and verse 18 says paul rebuked the demon a spirit of div divination inside a girl and the demon left her you know what is that it was god's power showing up for the person who went through the door god wanted him to God's favor god's power and god starts protecting him you know that's what comes our way when we go through divinely opened doors there is another thing you need to understand about divinely opened doors and that would be the fact that divinely opened doors do not guarantee trouble free journeys they just guarantee happy endings big time principle you need to understand they do not guarantee trouble free journeys they only guarantee happy endings when these people got to macedonia the first place they visited was a city called philippi what happens there paul was beaten paul was jailed there many people don't understand the word protection properly why does god offer you protection because things you need protection from will come your way are you getting this hallelujah what did paul, uh, what did god do for him god just simply saw to it that the beatings would never kill him his life was protected he wasn't maimed you know he was not crippled for life or anything like that god protected him many people don't realize it is god's protection that is keeping them they just think about the sufferings they go through but i want you to understand something my friend when you look at yesterday day before yesterday maybe in the, the, the last month you'll come to hear news about people walking on the same road you walked on today morning 
who looked to the left and looked to the right before they crossed, but still went under the vehicle. But look at you. You are like the Manathugani, you know, looking up into the skies, not bothering about who is coming your way. But still you are alive. It is not because of your muscle power. It is not because somebody else was on your side. Somebody else, you know, pushed the vehicles away. It was God's hand, God's favor that was keeping you, my friend. Just because a few prayer requests are left unanswered, don't think the hand of God is not protecting you. Just because you feel like having some chips but no chips are in sight, don't think the hand of God is not protecting you. You're still alive basically because God's hand is protecting you. You need to remember that. What happened? The journey was not trouble free. Paul was beaten, Paul was jailed. But you need to understand, the happy ending came when the jailer and his family came into the faith. Paul, you know, because he had revelation on how valuable a soul of man was, you know. He would have given his right hand to have so many people saved. He wouldn't mind the beatings. He wouldn't mind prison. He went to prison repeatedly. How many of you know this? Seeing those souls saved was more than a happy ending for him. And that is what God guarantees. Whatever comes in between, at the end, everything will work out for your good. What else? Divinely opened doors are sometimes disguised as problems and painful situations, you know. This is something you need to understand. It does not look like a proper door through which you can smoothly walk in. No. Sometimes it comes disguised. Disguised as painful situations, problems. Joseph's door to the prime minister's post in Egypt was inside inverted commas being sold into slavery. David's door to the throne was a mighty giant called Goliath. So what do we need to understand? When challenges come your way, when challenges come your way, when you face problems, when you face big time giants standing before you, threatening you, you need to understand, these might be doors God sends your way. These might be doors that are being opened before you by God. And that brings us to the eighth thought, which is you'll need God's help to identify the divinely opened door before you. Because 99% of the time, these doors present itself in disguises. You'll need God's help to identify them. What did Paul do? He did not try to force the shut door that God had shut. No, he let it be. What did he do then? He just simply waited on God. Maybe he prayed, asking God, guide me God. Show me what to do next. He did not hastily take decisions. He did not jump into something else and get himself into more trouble. No, he just waited. He had enough time to sleep and then dream. Most of us, you know, when we find a shut door before us, that is all it takes for us to lose sleep. We start pacing the uh, floor, you know, to the left, to the right. Even the devil who looks at us would get nervous seeing us. That is the way we will behave. But look at Paul. He's okay. He's got his trust in God, knowing whatever happens in my life, the steps of me, a righteous person, is ordered by my Lord, not the devil. He's got trust in that. He's got trust in God's wisdom. He knows what he's doing. He's got trust no full faith in God's goodness. He's a good, good God. It's not a song Paul sings. It is a revelation he has. It's a revelation he has. He takes it in faith. 
God will see me through this. God will see me through this. He just waited on God and allowed God to direct his paths. That is what we need to do. Understanding that when a door in our mind gets to be shut, there is a different door on God's mind that he holds open for us. That is when we need to put our faith, our trust in God and allow him to direct us. Let me read from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. The Bible says this way, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge God in all your ways and he shall direct your paths. What is that? If your life is a movie, he will be the director. Calling the shots, arranging the situations and the circumstances, telling people to do what needs to be done so that you might get the goodness of life. That's what he'll do when you trust in him with all your heart and you don't lean on your own understanding, meaning you don't do what you think is good. You acknowledge him. In all your ways. Meaning, whatever happens to you, you understand God is in the know of things. This, even though it surprised me, does not surprise my God. It's been allowed by my God. So it has to work out for my good. That's what acknowledging God in all our ways means. Hallelujah. Here's another thought for you. You know what that is? Divinely opened doors don't bring humanly desired results. They bring divinely ordained ones. You want me to repeat that? Divinely opened doors. They do not bring the results we desire. They bring the results God has ordained for us. There was a man named Jeremiah. Called to be a prophet to the nations, you know. And the doorway to ministry, that call, was given not by the devil but by God. He went through the door in obedience, you know. He was asked to do certain things. God told him, preach to these people. Tell them to repent. Come back to me. And he had to really suffer for going through that door. But can I tell you something? When this man did everything he did in obedience to his God, when he was continuously in fellowship with God, when he never said one word against God, the results he saw was not a nation coming back to God. No. If I were to count numbers, I might even say he did not see even one person coming to God, properly coming to God, you know. But was his ministry futile? No. He's successful. Why? Because he's doing what God wants him to do. He's fulfilling the purpose of God for his life. This is something we need to understand. Look at the life of Noah. Ark building was a door God opened for him, you know. It was his ministry door. 120 years he preached. To everybody he's on the road. To his neighbors, to the other people in the market, to the, his provision store owner. Everybody heard the gospel. What was the result? His family went inside the ark. Not even the carpenter who helped in the building of the ark got saved, you know. What was the result? Let me tell you what the result was. God later on says, this was a righteous man. And God ensures... That Noah doesn't go to hell, but gets to heaven. It is not the humanly desired results that come our way. It is the divinely ordained ones that come our way. When we go through the doors, God opens for us. We need to learn to be happy. Because God is smiling at us. Here's another thought before we close. When God holds a door open, you need to understand. For you to actually go through and walk on. You'll need to have, how can I shorten the list? One, faith. Two, forgiveness. Three, fellowship. Many people don't understand this, you know. They just think God opens a door and we can just walk through into blessing. It's not that way. Look at the Israelites standing before the Red Sea. 
They've got no way to go through, you know. And the way maker comes through by making a way for them. What does God do? He makes a great wind to blow on that sea and the sea gets to be parted. The water stands like walls on both sides and there is dry land, a road through the sea. Understand the scene. Imagine it with your heart. Look at this my friend. We, you know, how do we build walls? We use mortar, we use you know, bricks, we use cement and also water. When God built a wall, he, used, he does not use mortar, he does not use bricks. He knows cement is there, just water. Touch a neighbor and say, water is transparent. Imagine, we are going through that road. Two walls on both sides, maybe a hundred feet high, all transparent. And inside of that, there are whales and sharks and they are, you know, grinning at us with their sharp teeth and all. How will it be moving through that road? Every single moment I believe, in our hearts we would be thinking, if this thing breaks, have you been to Singapore? What a world. What if the glass breaks? What if we land up in the you know, mouth of the shark? I want to assure you, my friend, just because a door opened, you cannot go through. For you to use that door, you need faith. You need to believe that God who opened the way can hold it open until I get to the other side. It will not fall apart. I have to have that faith. Without it, I cannot go forward. And when you get to a door and you walk through, my friend, I want to assure you, there will be a hundred people you need to forgive. You need to walk in forgiveness. Paul, when he was at Philippi, he was actually beaten by the jailer's men. He was bruised, you know. And when the chains broke down and the prison doors opened and all that, we find the jailer running to the prison from his house and asking, where are the prisoners? Because he can't find the prisoners, he's getting ready to commit suicide. What would we Pentecostals do in such a situation? Let me tell you what I think we would do. The jailer is getting ready to put a sword to his own neck and we would just turn to each other and say, look at God's sannarshanam, right? They bet me yesterday, they're getting killed today. But you know what Paul says? He says to the jailer, do not harm yourself. We are all here. Meaning, even to the people who bet him up, he holds no grudge against. He's walking in forgiveness. So the little, little stumbles that he makes, the little, little mistakes that he commits, God keeps forgiving. And take him, takes him through to the next step, to the next step, to the next step. Can I tell you one more thing? You need God with you. Moses had this revelation. That is why he says, without your presence going with us, do not send us. You need God. You, you, just a word, you know. That is not enough. Just a few promises. That is not You need God with you. And for you to have fellowship with God. You need people who know God with you for you to be encouraged, to your faith, for your faith to be fed, for you to be prayed for. You need people of God with you. You need to have fellowship there also. How do you have this fellowship? First John chapter 1, 5, 6, 7, it would tell us, walk in the light as he is in the light so that we might have fellowship and we might have fellowship. Do you understand this? Vertical and horizontal fellowship comes when we walk in the light. What is that light? It is the word of God. We walk according to the word of God. Faith, forgiveness and fellowship with God and man. That is what it will take for us to go through and keep on until we reach what we are looking for. Final thing I want to share with you. What is that? Believe God for his best always. 
Believe God for His best always, 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 always. Believe in the fact that God can do anything, friend. God can do anything. Joseph found this out. God could free him, direct a flow of favor to him, lift him up from the prison to the post of prime minister. God could do it. And in the same manner, my friend, believe for the best. How believe that God can balance those books of account? When we write accounts, you know, it will always be tipped in our favor. We've prayed so much, we've waited so much, we've suffered so much, we've done this, we've given so much of offering. And on the other side, it's not balanced. God has not worked on our behalf. Let me just tell you a story I heard once. A missionary who was, you know, doing missionary work in Africa was returning home. He was on a ship moving towards the shores of America. Somewhere in the middle of the journey, he heard some noise on the deck and suddenly found out that the president of the U.S. was also on the same ship. The president and the missionary both were heading home, you know. When they got near the shore, there was a huge group of people waiting. Everybody had the U.S. national flag in their hands. They were waving it and calling out, Long live our president and all that. Seeing all the, you know, uh, the arrangements that were done to welcome the president, and the missionary felt a little sad, a little disappointed. He was feeling, this man is a politician. Maybe he's not done everything right. Maybe he's not even fulfilled God's will for his life. But look at me and look at him. He is getting such a warm welcome. So many people are looking forward to meet him. So much of arrangement, so much of money has been, hallelujah, you know, spent just to welcome him in. Missionary thought to himself, I've been serving God for so many years on the dark continent of Africa. I've been suffering. I did not live in a good house. I did not eat good food. I've got not much good clothes. Look at me. I'm coming home. There is nobody to even you know, wait for me or welcome me. He was feeling a little sad. Maybe his you know, eyes started welling up with tears. The missionary later on wrote in an article to other missionaries. You know, he said, while I was thinking that thought and my eyes were filling up with tears, the Holy Spirit suddenly talked to me and said, but my son, you've not yet reached home. What a powerful word. What a powerful word. But my son, you've not yet reached home. The president of the United States might have gotten to his house. That is why there is such a huge welcome for him. The Holy Spirit said, but my son, for you, home is not on the shores of America. Home is on the eternal shores of heaven. And God assured him, when you get there, when you get there, it will not be the angels who are waiting to welcome you. It will not be the company of the saints that are waiting to welcome you. I, your master, I'll be there to hold your hand, to bring you in, and you'll be with me forevermore. God started speaking to him and telling him, there'll be no more tears, no more sickness, no more pain. No more poverty. There will be joy forevermore. And I want to tell you something my friend. When we get to the other side. When we start enjoying what God has prepared for us. I want to assure you of one thing. You will come to testify all accounts have been balanced. We will never be able to tell God. I prayed so much but didn't get anything. We'll never be able to tell God, I cried so much, I suffered so much, but you did not give me enough. Just taking a look, maybe, outside the compound wall of heaven, out there, at hell, and those people in there, we will just run to God, hug Him, and tell Him, Lord, thank you for saving me. 
Actually, that is all it takes to balance the accounts. And we need to have revelation on the fact that even if God does not do any more miracles for us ever in a lifetime, He's already done enough for us to be indebted to Him forevermore. Let us be grateful children. Not children who get to be irritated because we did not get our chocolates or did not get our diapers changed on time. And let us be children who look to the Father and say, Father, thank you for saving me. Thank you for getting me out of hell and into this heaven. Thank you for every moment when you were with me, for your hand that protected me, for your miraculous provision in my life. Let me just believe in you that when doors on my mind shut, you just were redirecting me, rerouting my journey, taking me to the destination you have ordained for me. And I know, Father, because I love you and you have called me, all things will work together for my good. Would you just stand in God's prayer? Can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood Jesus